Kirsten, tell me about Glen Farkless. So Glen Farkless Distillery was established in 1836. That's when we got a legal license to distill whiskey. It has been in the same family since 1865, which is the Grant family, and they still own it today. That's amazing. And what's the most iconic range of whiskies which you, you, you have? So we've got our family cast collection. So that's a collection running currently on sale from 1954 to 2006. Um, we've also got our sort of core ranges, so our age expressions of the 10, the 12, the 15, and the sort of 25. And one of our sort of more iconic ones would be our 105 cask strength whiskey. What's it like coming to work every day here? Because it's an amazing <laughs> location. So, I mean, it's beautiful. Driving in, you know, the snow's maybe a little bit tricky, um, but it is a stunning place to work. You've got the views out over the sort of green valley there as well, um, and you've got Ben Rennes up beside us. <laughs> and, and actually, the Glen Farkless is actually named after the hill. Yes, yeah, so Glen Farkless is Glen Fiara Glass, so Gaelic, which translates in English to the Valley of Green Grass. Absolutely um, amazing. And what can tourists expect to do when they come and do a, a distillery tour? What's unique about your distillery here at Glen Farkless? So, I mean, one of the sort of unique things is the fact that we are still family owned, family run and independent. So that's our big thing. Also, where we're standing in the warehouse, you know, tourists get to come in, they get to see the warehouse if they come along on a tour. So, you know, your traditional Dunnage warehouse, you know, showcasing the best of what Glen Farkless has to offer. What's your favourite expression from Glen Farkless? <laughs> That's a hard question, that one. Um, so my favourite is probably the 105. So with it being a cask strength, it's got very toffee flavours, which is something that I personally like in a whisky. And yes, it is, you know, it's going to be strong, but it's so smooth that it actually is quite easy drinking as far as cask strengths go. What would be your, your favourite type of tour? I mean, the type of people that are the best for coming around on tours, you know, are people who are, you know, genuinely interested, you know, and it's really lovely having a conversation, you know, not necessarily just speaking out to people. It's actually being able to ask questions, you know, and we learn something new every time we go around as well. You know, that's kind of what we say here, you know, you learn something new every day and that's coming from the people who visit us. And we want to, to build up more of a conversation rather than a sort of straight tour of talking to people. And it makes it fresh friendlier, it makes it more personal and allows us to adapt it to who's coming in if we're getting to know the people who are visiting us here. Yeah. What, is the, what is the oldest cast you have in your warehouses? So the oldest cast that we have is actually in this warehouse here. So that is a 1953 cask um, and we'll maybe be able to, to take a little look at it in a little bit as well. Fantastic. And are any plans to bottle that as a, a family? Reserve or? Probably not a family reserve, um, but we're maybe building up to sort of a slightly older whiskey where it could potentially be, in theory, you know, 70 year old or it could be a, a 71, you know, it just, it depends on, on what we're looking at at the time. And do you know how many bottles are actually left in the cask? Well, that's the big question, yeah. isn't it? Um, hopefully, you know, if it was a sort of sherry hogshead is what the cask is, you know, realistically, we're probably looking at, you know, below half of a cask now, you know, is probably quite a safe assumption. Um, so it'll just be a, a waiting game and once we bottle them, we'll know exactly how many we're going to get out of it. Now, I know you actually live in, in, in Abelow, just up the road, five yeah. miles up the road. What's it like to live in Speyside and whiskey country and grow up here? Well, you know, the irony is that if you live here, you get used to it, you know, and you don't necessarily always appreciate, you know, what's around you. And I think since working here, you know, it's really made me go out and go and visit other distilleries and really get to know what's actually around you in Speyside, you know, sort of tourism wise as well, being able to tell people coming in, well, this is really good, you know, you should go and have a, have a little look at this and stuff. So I think, um, no, it's a pretty, pretty beautiful place to live, especially, you know, River Spey, you've got mountains around you, you're what, 45 minutes from Abbey Moor in the Cairngorms, so pretty stunning part of the world to live in. So do you, um, where would you recommend that tourists go to? What's, what's particularly beautiful about space? Are there any particular lovely vistas for people to, to look at? For us as a local, would probably be the Lynn Falls. 
you know, it's beautiful. You've got the waterfall. You're actually starting to see the color of the water is nice and dark. So the same as it is here, it's going to be naturally filtered through the peat, which gives it that darker color. And it's like looking through a dark glass bottle, but it's a, a stunning photograph. And I think it made it TikTok viral at some point as well. <laughs> So as a local, if someone's staying in Abra they might be staying at the Downs Hotel or the Mash Tun. Is there another a pub that you locals go to in, in, in town and enjoy? Oh, we quite like the Copper Dog in Krigeliki as well. Okay, it's a little bit further away, but you know, Speyside is slightly more spaced out. You know, it isn't going to be like being in a city. So sometimes, you know, 10, 15 minutes is usually pretty worth it. So yeah, yeah the Downs Hotel, Krigelki Copper Dog, the Highlander in Krigelki is really good as well. Yeah. Um, so they're all favourites, you know, got, got to try and test them all. Um, so illicit distilling was obviously a really big thing here in Scotland for quite a while. You know, maybe don't want to talk about it too much. Um, but, you know, it was common and it was what people had to do. And I mean, if you look back at the history of whiskey, you know, what it started out like was, you know, just your uskaba, your clear spirit. And that's what the Scots were drinking. Um, and over time, it's developed into these beautifully matured whiskies that we have, you know, the sherry, the port, the bourbon, things like that. Um, but, you know, that's not what it always was. And I think the funniest story that I have ever been told, and I will, I will pass this along, um, is to do with the illicit stilling. And what they were doing was they were effectively hiding up in the mountains. You know, I got taken to look for an illicit still during lockdown and, you know, climbing over hills, you know, mountains, wandering the countryside for hours on end, wading through heather up to here, you know. Apparently it was down here, but it, it was here. <laughs> um, but we eventually found this illicit still and it was up the Cabrich. And I mean, all it was, was, you know, three stone walls, roughly my height, you know, set into the side of a cliff. And, you know, you had to fall down a cliff to get there, but you got there. And, you know, that's how they were distilling whiskey, right the way up in the mountains, out of sight of everybody that was, you know, trying to find them. And they were producing the spirit and it was so, so popular. And, you know, they had their illicit stills, you would sit them inside, you had a trickle of water, you know, running down past your, your still. And that's how they made whiskey. And it was incredible. And that's just how determined Scots are to make sure they've got whiskey. Um, but, you know, they had to get a bit more creative, taking it down the mountain, you know, getting it past the excisemen and they would sort of hammer containers into coffins and they would walk down with their coffins, you know, right under the excisemen's noses and, and nobody ever noticed. They never cottoned on. Um, I think the best thing I ever heard was they had, you know, casks and they were nicking back casks of rich landowners who were having sherry and port casks shipped into the country. You know, they were enjoying the sherry in the port and they were just chucking the casks away. So the distillers, frugal as ever, would nick them back and they would fill their new spirit into them and they would use it as a sort of upgraded way of carting their spirits down the mountain. But they found that when the excisemen came looking for them, they then had to hide, you know, and well, if they got their stills, nothing you could do about it, but it didn't mean you had to give them your whiskey. So they got creative and they would bury the casks in bogs and they would leave them, you know, for what, three, four years. And they would come back and go, you know what, I buried a cask there. And they found that the longer they left this clear spirit inside of the cask, the sweeter and more palatable it actually became. And, you know, that's why it is for us traditional to use sherry and port casks to mature your whiskey in. So there you go. A little bit of history knocked down there as well. <laughs> Just wrapping up, yeah. is there anything we should you'd like to finally say about Glenfarclas? I think, you know, the biggest thing for us is the fact that we are family owned. And I think when you're here, you tend to get a feel for that. And, you know, it is it's a really nice place to not just work, but to visit, to come round. We like to, you know, let people get up close and personal with everything. And I mean, OK, we're, we're standing here and amongst all the casks and things. And I think that kind of sums us up pretty well. Thank you very much indeed. That's quite OK. <laughs>